This is chapter number six, peasants and farmers. What we discussed in earlier discussion was the situation of peasants and farmers in England and USA. And the differences were there, but certain similarities were also there. Now we'll talk about India. And as we know, after the Battle of Plassey in 1757, British rule was gradually established in India. And this was the colonial rule. The things changed, specifically the farmer life and the landscape. The British saw this land or the revenue which, are, which they are getting from land as the major source of government income. For that, because they wanted a regular system of land revenue, so they just expanded the area under cultivation. And because of this, once the area of cultivation increases, the area will come from where? It will come from forest and pastures. So the area of the forest and pastures, they declined. And this created various problems for peasants and pastoralists. Because of the strict, very strict rules and regulations, by the, this rule, the forest and graze, grazing was uh, restricted. And also, there are certain more problems which uh, these peasants, farmers, they faced. And other people who were actually, uh, you know, we talked about nomadic also at that time. Now, the uh, crop which Indian people or the peasant, Indian peasant and farmers, they grow, it was totally dependent now in the colonial rule with respect to the world. That is, in the early 19th century, indigo and opium, these were the two of the major commercial crops. Indigo and opium. So, we are going to talk a lot about, a lot about this opium. And after that, by the end of the century, that is the 19th century, the cash crops, that is sugar cane, cotton, jute, wheat, there are other crops which are exported in order to feed whom? In order to feed, feed Europe, in order to feed or you can say supply the mills of Lancashire and Manchester in England. So how this Indian cultivators, when the modern world or international commerce or trade or export took place, how does Indian cultivators respond? This is we are going to talk with an example of one crop opium. One crop opium. So we will talk, we will be talking about Bengal area where uh, and how this opium came into picture. So this all started with certain other thing. That is, this is an after effect or this was the one of the thing which took place because of certain things which are going on the other place. What are the other places? China and England. Now the history of this opium as I said is, is linked with the story of British trade in China. In the late 18th century, the English East India Company, it was buying tea and silk from China. They take tea and silk from China and they send it or take it to England. This is what East India Company was doing. And this tea, Chinese tea, tea was very famous and popular drink there. If you see the, the growth of these drinkers or you can say import, that is in 1785, about 15 million pound of tea was being imported to England. Whereas by 1830, the figure jumped from 15 million pounds to 30 million pounds. And of course, East India Company was making profits. And this was totally dependent on the tea, tea trade, chai, tea trade. But there was a problem. The problem was that the Confucius uh, or Confucian rur rurals of China, Mancus, they were suspicious about the, the foreign entry because East India Company belonged to England. And they just don't want to open their market or allow the foreign goods to enter. So now in this situation, how the East India Company is going to get the tea? Because there has to be a balance in trade. If you take tea, you have to give something. You have to give something. So the idea was, the, the solution was, 
while they were buying tea, they are pay, paying the Chinese in silver coins or bullion. But again, there was a problem. The problem was that the English people, they thought that if you are giving silver coins to the Chinese for the trade of or trading of tea, then this silver coins, there is a loss of treasure. You are giving silver coins from our treasure. And this will impoverish the nation and deplete the nation that is English wealth. So, you cannot do that. What, what could be the commodity they could sell, that is the East Indian company or the others, they could sell in China in order to buy tea. So, there need to be some commodity. And the commodity was opium, affine. See, the Portuguese actually introduced this opium into China in early 16th century, but at that time it was just used for medical prop, uh, properties and uh, in the medicines. And they, the Chinese were well aware of that this opium is an addiction. It, you know, you, we, you can only sell or the emperor has only allowed it for uh, the medicinal purposes, nothing else. But there was illegal trade from the western merchants in mid 18th century. They were just taking the opium and uh, sending it or, or selling it to the local agents of China in number of seaports of southern eastern China. If you see the, how, what was the trade, uh, by the early 1820s about 10,000 crates were being annually smuggled into China and if you take the number uh, in uh, some 15 years after this 10,000 crates changed to 35,000 crates of opium being unloaded every year in China Chinese soil right so there was a triangular trade I will just talk about this triangular trade uh, just in a bit so now the English also did that. The English needed the Chinese tea. So they, they thought, okay, why not to give them opium in trade, in exchange. So people of all class now, because English were just, uh, you know, now trading with opium, people of all class, because now, because this illegal trading was going on, the people of all classes, may it be drug shop, drug, the shopkeepers, peddlers, army men, aristocrats, paupers, everyone was addicted because of this illegal trade. Uh, I told you about the numbers. Now, English, as I said, they also found an idea. Why not to exchange the opium in exchange of tea? Lin Zhe Zhu. He was a commissioner at Canton. This is an area. This is an area of in China. In 1839, he estimated that 4 million opium smokers are there in China. And a British doctor also, he put the figure close to 12 million. So now as the country, that is the Chinese country, become the addicted country, British trade in tea, in a tea flourished. And the return was, of course, opium. So the return from sale, opium sale financed the tea purchases in China. So where did this opium come from? Now, English want opium. They want to send it to China. They want opium in order to send it to China because they want tea in return. So there was a triangle and this triangle this is England, this is China, which is the third country. This opium came from India. So now I'll go back to this triangular trade. See, this is England, this is China, and this is Calcutta, India. Now the British were taking the opium from Calcutta or Bengal or India, and now they are trading it, it with the Chinese and taking the tea back to England. This is the triangular trade. But the thing was, how did opium come from? As I said, it will come from India. 
when british actually conquered bengal they made a very determined effort in order to grow opium in in which lands because they now conquered bengal so the areas which are under their control they wanted to produce opium and as we just saw that the opium expanded the market of opium was too much in china larger volumes of opium is going from bengal ports to china see before 1767 just 500 chest of two uh, mounds see one mound is a, actually mound is a measure of weight one mound or one sare is this one mun this is called mun one mound or mun is 40 sears or 40 sare one sare is just little less than a kg so before 1767 just 500 chest exported from india but just in 4 years it it trebled means in 100 years in 1870 this is 1767 and 1870 around 100 years gap the government was exporting this english were exporting 50000 chest annually they were exporting it so now supplies need to be increased because the the export trade was booming the opium has to be cultivated so how these indians or indian cultivators are to be persuaded there are various reasons for which they were unwilling to turn their field over uh, the to poppy that is to be, uh, to grow opium what was the reason so we'll take the reason one by one you need to understand there are certain points four four uh, reasons basically so the first reason is the crop had to be grown on the best land that is always near the villages and uh, well manured and these are the areas where peasants they produce pulses now they cannot grow pulses there if they even grow they they will the pulses will be inferior this was the first reason why they were unwilling the peasants were unwilling first is that the opium needs a very fertile land secondly many cultivators own no land so they have to lease the land from the landlords but the rent charged by these landlords are quite high especially in the area nearby the villages so this is the second cause or second reason why they were unwilling third is the cultivation of opium is itself a very challenging and difficult process plant are very delicate cultivators had to spend long hours they don't have enough time to care for other crops this is the fourth reason and finally the price of the government paid to the cultivators who are growing opium was very low right it was an unprofitable job for them so if you see there are four reasons first why they were unwilling first uh, the crop needs fertile land and it it was it needs to be near villages and well manured and then if you take the second one the uh, to cultivate they because they had no land so they have to take the land from uh, in lease from the landlords and uh, this cultivators or no land this is the second reason so third reason is cultivation of opium was very difficult process by itself and third the price the government gave them was very low so these are the four reasons so how these always unwilling cultivators were made to, or they were made to accept to produce opium the idea was to give the money in advance because the rural areas bengal and bihar the, they were poor peasants they don't have money enough to buy food and clothing so uh, if the money is given in advance that is the village headman is given money and they will offer a loan to the cultivators and those who don't have money and they are getting the money in the advance they will be tempted so they are tempted because the present problem is solved because of fooding fooding and clothing so that is why they took the loan and once they took the loan the thing is they will be like bandua mazdoor means they have to work for those people from them from whom they have taken loan 
and they can only grow the crop and once they grow the crop the agents will cut the crop they have no right of cutting the crops or selling it to anyone else and the price were very very low offered to them and this uh, as i said that government was reluctant to increase the price of opium because the price they want this production of opium to be very cheap and they want to sell it to a very high price to the opium agents so the difference of the cheap rate of production and high price of giving it to the agents in calcutta the difference is actually their revenue so this happened and you know the peasants because they were angry they are not getting any money so they just refused to take advances and people if you see an example in benares they stopped growing opium they produced sugar cane and potatoes instead and they would even sell their crop to the traveling traders that is pie cars who are offering them high prices now by 1773 the british government has all the control on the opium no one can means anybody else than the government is permitted to trade this so if you see the central india and rajasthan those territories which were not the british territories the opium opium was uh, the opium production was increasing why because the local traders were offering much higher prices to peasants and exporting opium to china rather than what british government is giving to the to the peasants who are the, under their control so now the british thought it to be illegal they wanted to stop it it was smuggling for them so they in, uh, instructed its agent posted in the princely state to confis confiscate all the opium and all destroy all the crops so there was a conflict always between british government peasants and local traders as long as the opium production lasted now if you see that the uh, experience what we saw is all peasants in colonial india were like that for opium cultivators it is not like that means opium cultivators have a different experience and there are other cultivators also like they have different experiences in conclusion what i can say is we talked about uh, england usa and india so the idea is that the pattern was changing somewhere it was no you can say new uh, machines somewhere there were machines and somewhere it is the trade basically the trade which influenced or affected or introduced the new crop which were being grown and how the colonial rule or the people who owned the trade Uh, did to peasants and farmer farmers and how did they react this is what we saw in this discussion and this is just a picture of the pack chest of opium being taken to gazipur railway station in the 19th century so this is all about this topic thank you so much take care of yourself